The steam locomotive. In the history of man, few of their inventions have been so important, so iconic, and so alive. The golden age of steam saw thousands of these mighty machines roaring across the continental United States. To most Americans, the lonesome whistle in the distance was commonplace, as if the locomotives and their voices were a natural part of the landscape. But to the men and women who worked with them, these magnificent engines were more than machines. They were partners and companions. They were powerful, living beasts. They were a source of pride and accomplishment. But few railroaders had the right to such a pride, as did those of the Southern Railway. In 1924, then-President Fairfax Harrison introduced the slogan, The Southern Serves the South, and serve it they did. With the assistance of their glamorous green and gold Pacifics, rugged consolidations, and faithful Mikados, the employees of the Southern Railway devoted themselves to the communities they served, weathered the storm of the Great Depression, and honorably carried out their daily assignments. But even sentiment could not stop progress, and change came swiftly on the Southern. The world could only watch as craftsmen lost their trades, railroaders lost their heritage, and railroading lost its romance. There was an age in which locomotives exhibited just as much personality as they did power. There was an age in which men loved their machines as they did their own families. There was an age in which an industry could spark the imagination and shape the future. And for the Southern Railway in 1953, that golden age was over. A pleasing and noteworthy feature of the attitude of the men is the esprit de corps which prevails. Every man is proud of the establishment he works for, the oldest of its kind in the country, and every man is proud to be known as a Baldwin man. John W. Converse, 1903. In October 1911, a clerk at Baldwin Locomotive Works of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, took down an order in the builder's engine register. The order consisted of 15 superheated 2A2 Mikado locomotives placed by the Southern Railway. Beginning with what would become Baldwin's 37,085th locomotive. Shortly after the clerk copied the order into the register, the approximately 20,000 employees of Baldwin Locomotive Works smelted, cast, and constructed Southern Railway's first MS class steam locomotive, number 4501. Well, the 4501 was the first 282 Mikado class steam locomotive that the Southern Railway had purchased. And at that time, it was a fairly large locomotive back in 1911. It was replacing consolidation locomotives similar to its sister that we have here at TVRM, the 630, and others. And in some instances, 4501 was that much more powerful that it could replace two locomotives on, for certain services. So you had that going for it. Plus it was a superheated locomotive, so it, it, was, it was more powerful because of that superheated steam. A superheater on a steam locomotive basically takes the steam in the boiler that's saturated, has a lot of wet particles still in it, runs it through a series of pipes that go through the fire tubes. And what it does is it reheats that steam to an actual elevated temperature and dries it out even more. And it makes it more efficient you can get more energy out of it, and the railroads learned that fairly early on. With a hefty price tag of $23,182, or more than half a million dollars today, the 4501 was delivered with 63-inch driving wheels and operated at a boiler pressure of 175 PSI, which resulted in 51,625 pounds of tractive effort. Each MS-Class Mikado weighed in at 272,900 pounds and had a 212-square-foot firebox. She was eventually joined by 181 sisters. The needs of the, the transportation industry and the demands that were placed on you know, things increased because of the growing country. They had to have larger locomotives, they had to have larger freight cars. They made the rail larger. Everything increased in size to, to meet the demand that uh, our growing nation was putting forth on the railroads. When you go, you want to take as much as you can take with you when you go. So uh, I think that uh, it was a natural progression from the 280 class to the 282 class as they increased the size of the boilers and the attractive effort and uh, 
you know, the capacity of the, the ability to pull larger trains. 4501's career on the Southern was long and varied. At first, she was assigned to the eastern part of the system and slowly migrated south through the years. Well, a lot of times when people ask us about 4501, they want the interesting stories. Well, you know, what trains did it pull when it was in regular service? Well, a rather unremarkable life on Southern, pulling bland, fairly short freight trains on unknown lines. It didn't pull the Southern Crescent between Washington and New Orleans, anything like that. It was a freight locomotive. This 1912 photograph shows 4501 in Bulls Gap, Tennessee, with one of her early crews proudly posed on the running board. Oh, it certainly had a very 1900s look to it. Uh, very different from how its appearance is today. The high-mounted acetylene headlight, round sand domes, boiler-mounted bell, and protruding pilot were all typical of a 1911 locomotive. The locomotive was reshopped as all of the southern locomotives were in the 30s. And uh, they all took on a much more of a USRA appearance once they went through the chop in the 30s. And uh, that's, that's the prototypical style that the locomotive is more or less in today. Sometime in the 1920s, 4501 went to work on southern Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Texas Pacific subsidiary, handling road freights based out of Somerset, Kentucky. The C&O and TP, or rat hole as many railroaders called it, owing to its 27 tunnels, likely necessitated the addition of a Wimble smoke duct to negate the constant onslaught of exhaust on the crews. It was likely during her time at Ferguson Shops in Somerset, Kentucky, that her frame was bent on an undocumented accident. There are some details of 4501's life as a freight hauling engine that are kind of bizarre. Very early on, only a couple years into service, it, wasn't, it didn't even make it into the 20s, so within the first nine years of service it developed a crack in the uh, third course, and the railroad had to patch it. The patch is still on it as a matter of fact. Following that up to the end of its career, it saw the lowest mileage of any of its class. It had vast periods that it spent in the shop without any real records as to why. There was one instance where it was in the shop for eight months and it's hypothesized that that was when it had whatever wreck or altercation or whatever was something something somewhere that resulted in the back end of the frame being bent and then replacing the second course to allow for an offset in between the firebox and the, uh, the, 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 the front end of the boiler. By the year 1935 the 4501 was yet again reassigned this time to Princeton Indiana it was here, on the St. Louis Division, that 4501 served out her final years as a freight engine for the Southern Railway. They weren't one of the, the richer roads, you know, the more, more prosperous roads. I mean, they did okay, I'm sure. But I think that they chose in their progression to, to maintain and improve the locomotives that they had. Therefore, by the time of war, they were pretty worn out locomotives. So at the point where the diesel era was knocking at the front door, the Southern Railway was behind the game, I would attribute it to a very astute uh, corporate level management team that realized that steam was on its way out and you know what, let's just move on. We're in a good place to do it financially, we can afford it, let's go. Southern's first FT diesels were purchased by the railroad in 1941. Due to weight restrictions on many steam locomotives, the St. Louis Division was one of the first to be completely dieselized. This resulted in many of 4501's sisters being reassigned, but sadly, that was not her fate. In July 1948, her fire was dropped and she was sent to the storage lines in Princeton. The future seemed unsure and almost certainly bleak. The 4501 was an exception in that uh, it was sold off uh, long before they stopped operating steam on the Southern, uh, where they retained most of the 4500 class locomotives. And that's how it wound up at the K&T. L.C. Bruce was a man on a mission. He was the master mechanic of the Kentucky and Tennessee Railway, 
a coal hauling short line in Stearns, Kentucky, and he needed a new locomotive. With grades topping out at 3.5% in rugged mountain territory, the K&T needed brute power. As a former employee on the Southern Railway, Mr. Bruce went looking for his new engine on their property, eventually ending up at Princeton. Having been stored in good condition and meeting the size and power requirements for his railroad, 4501 seemed perfect. Out of the three candidates, Mr. Bruce chose the eldest of the Rhodes Mikados to bring back to Stearns on October 7, 1948. He had her delivered to Stearns under her own power. 4501 had beaten the odds by a long shot. After arriving on the K&T, 4501 was renumbered to 12 as she was the 12th engine K&T owned. The employees of the K&T fell in love with her almost immediately. Capable of pulling 90 tons more up the mountain than her largest stablemate, number 11, she was quickly nicknamed the Big Engine. Stearns was an interesting place. They had a huge three or four story wooden hotel up there. And we would go up and stay in the hotel. Hedy and Brakeman always sat out on the front of the engine, you know, and stayed out of the heat and the smoke, you know, while they were going up the mountain. And you would think he was not going to get to the next piston stroke. He was down to that slow like that. And the exhaust on that thing would split your eardrums working up that, that grade. I mean, you know, they were down to almost stop, but it was still, you know, just down to walking speed, you know. And when he came up out of that thing, that was something to see, pulling that stuff. As K and T12 worked away in Stearns, things were rapidly changing on the outside world. By June of 1950, Southern had already retired 108 of 4501's 181 MS class sisters. Other steam classes were falling fast as well, with division after division succumbing to dieselization. Just five short years after the sale of 4501 to the K&T, the last steam-powered freight train on the Southern arrived into Chattanooga, Tennessee at 3 p.m. on Wednesday, June 17, 1953. In 1954, a chance meeting took place in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Bob Sewell, Jr., an employee of the General Railway Signal Company, was working on Southern Railway's brand new DeButts Yard. Bob had an incredible array of talents uh, and, and interests, uh, from uh, player pianos to uh, cars to trains. Almost anything mechanical uh, was of interest to him. The man was was a giant among men, uh, very soft-spoken, but just a giant because of his knowledge, his dedication. He had the ability to figure things out. He could think ahead and have a plan to implement different ideas, even on a shoestring budget. The 30-year-old Georgian with a big picture outlook and a love of steam locomotives struck up a conversation with a curious onlooker. That onlooker turned out to be Paul Merriman. Paul Merriman was an electrical engineer who worked for DuPont. He was a lone ranger. Paul was uh, definitely a, a very unique individual. He would be forever ordering equipment and stuff, and the bosses, no one would even know anything about it until all this huge shipment came in, you know, and just was off doing, you know, what he thought it ought to be. I'm sure anybody who knew Paul has a series of stories that would lead you to think that he was an eccentric individual. You probably have heard the word eccentric used. I would say he's absolutely eccentric. And in some respects, he bordered on genius, if not outright genius. Uh, he was certainly extremely bright mechanically and electrically. I'm not exactly sure, you know, how the introduction occurred, but he, he crossed paths with my father, and uh, they both figured out really quick that they had an interest in uh, steam, and uh, they formed a, an immediate friendship, really, and began uh, almost immediately touring the southeast, uh, filming the remnants of steam operation uh, in the late 50s. The Gainesville Midland, uh, the n and the K&T, and some other other railroads as well. 
Over the course of the next five years, Merriman and Sewell used their time off work to chase, photograph, and record the final hours of NW Steam. Once Steam had officially died on the NW, the duo turned their attention to the few remaining short line railroads in the area that still ran Steam. After a short tenure on the Gainesville Midland Railroad that ended in abrupt dieselization, they found their way to L.C. Bruce's Little Railroad in Kentucky. During their many trips to Stearns, Merriman and Sewell developed a fondness for number 12. Clearly a lady of southern railway descent when compared to her K&T Ray's stablemates. In fact, Paul spent a week off work as a volunteer fireman on number 12 in the early 60s. And it was on one of the trips while they were filming uh, the last of the n and steam that Paul and my father had the discussion about, you know, we've got to do something to save some of this before it all goes to the scrapper. And that was really the first conversation they had about forming some kind of chapter or organization or museum or group here in Chattanooga. I think that the founding of TVR was a result of uh, Bob and Paul's you know, friendship and exploration of, of steam in the, in the, you know, the East and the Southeast, you know, during that late 50s, early 60s period. They were very enthused about doing something in Chattanooga, and that's with a group of other individuals, they started TVRM 1961. By 1963, 4501 had worked for the Kentucky and Tennessee Railroad for 15 years as their engine number 12, and now even K&T was dieselizing. L.C. Bruce, the same man who had purchased the 4501 15 years prior, was now tasked with finding a new home for her or resort to selling her for scrap. Paul and Bob, communicating with different people, found out that those engines were available. They began to hear noises that the uh, K&T had bought three Alcos. And uh, so that they knew, you know, the end of steam was was coming there as well. Uh, and when they approached Mr. Bruce and asked him, you know, are you going to sell the locomotives? And he said he was. Uh, he had not come to a price at that time, uh, but that he was going to sell them. Paul asked at that time, you know, would you sell me personally one of the locomotives? And he said he would think about it. I don't remember how we managed to do it, but we scraped $5,000 together to go up and buy the 4501. And there were six or eight of us that went up. And Mr. Bruce had a small office, you know, just to build. And so we sent Paul in to buy the engine. So after a short period of time, Paul came out and his very words were, says, fellas, I did it. And Bob said, you did what, Paul? Those are the very exact words. And Paul said, I bought the 4501. He had gone in there and bought the engine for himself. You know, they went up and Paul did actually purchase the locomotive for $5,000. And then they started trying to figure out how they were going to get it to Chattanooga. Bill Brosnan demanded excellence, and there's nothing really wrong with that, quite frankly. I think that was uh, what pushed Southern Railway to be the leader in innovation was Bill Brosnan. Was he a tough guy to work for? Yes, he was. Was he sometimes ruthless? Eh, some might say he was. But if you tried, did your best, exemplified the effort, the true Southern innovation thinking, you were good to go. Southern Railway stepped out ahead by replacing steam locomotives with diesel. D.W. Brosnan was president of the Southern Railway in 1964. His innovative yet controversial management tactics made Southern a case study in modernization. But in Brosnan's eyes, a steam locomotive was the exact opposite of modernization. After several failed attempts at securing permission from local management to run a steam engine from Stearns to Chattanooga, Merriman made a last-ditch trip to Southern's headquarters in Washington, D.C., where he spoke with Macon Tollison, Vice President of Operations. He was reluctant to approach Brosnan, but cleverly enlisted the help of William Graham Clater, Jr., Southern Railway's Vice President of Law. W. Graham Clater was a, uh, a true Southern gentleman. 
He, uh, he was a, a strong leader, uh, very resolute in his thinking, um, a, a fair and, and, and genuine person. Being an avid steam enthusiast, he was eager to assist. No doubt using the same tactics as he did in court, Claytor made a case to Brosnan that ultimately secured a one-time only pass for a trip down the CNO and TP. Unaware of what had transpired, Merriman was at home in Chattanooga when he received a call from the same local manager who had denied his previous requests. He wanted to know when Merriman could be ready to move the engine to Chattanooga under its own power. Merriman and Sewell immediately went to work with a team of volunteers from TVRM. They kept it parked over. They had a, like a big pond out there beside the shop and they kept it sitting on the spur track over there. And it was absolutely filthy, you know. I mean, it had been sitting there forever, and of course they didn't wash engines or do anything, you know, like that to keep them. It, when they were not concerned with the appearance of the engine, just the functional part of the operation. And so we had to clean that thing up, and then it, of course, had the K&T uh, name on it and the big number 12 on it, so we painted all that out cleaned the engine up, you know, washed it, and then painted 4501 on the tender, and then painted all the windows, the, you know, the woodwork red and the roof red, and polished the bell up the best we could. And we spent, I don't know, I guess a couple of three weekends getting the thing cleaned up, and. Uh, Various numbers of us would go up until we got ready to bring it, bring it back down. The trip was, after all, to be a momentous occasion. The first steam-powered train on the CNO and TP in more than a decade, and both TVRM and the Southern intended to make a show of it. It was early on the morning of June 6, 1964. Once again, proudly wearing her original road number, 4501 had a fire in her belly and steam built up to take her home. Trailing her tender and loaded with guests invited by the railroad were the sleeping car Shenandoah Valley, an open-air gondola with added seats, and Southern Railway office car number six. At the throttle was Walter Dove, Southern's road foreman of engines, who had spent the majority of his career working on steam and would soon become synonymous with the 4501 herself. Walter Dove was road foreman of engines, and he was a favorite of Mr. Claytor's. Mr. Claytor knew him, and uh, you, you just about had to have two firemen. He blew the whistle so much all the time that he used about as much steam blowing the whistle as, as, he, <laughs> as he did running the locomotive. He was an old school engineer who knew his business. At 8.04 a.m., 4501 eased out onto the main line in Stearns, ready to charge south. Bob and Paul chased the train back and made pictures of it as we came back to Chattanooga. We left Stearns and we got down, as I remember, right across the Tennessee line. And we had a serious hot box on the, on the tender. And we had to stop. And of course, Brosnan was watching that train and everybody on the railroad knew it. And they called for, for help, you know. And you never saw so many people come out of the bushes in your life. There was, there was 50 people, 60 people showed up just almost instantly to get that train. We were on the main line, you know, to get that train, that engine fixed up. No other serious issues were encountered for the remainder of the trip. As the train charged south towards Chattanooga, excitement and anticipation filled the air. Walter Dove turned around to the fireman, and I don't remember the fireman's name, but he says, you know what? He says, you, could, would you believe they're paying us to do this? You know, and they were having a big time. And every town that we came to, you know, the word had spread that a steam engine was going to be coming through. And when we got down like Spring City and Dayton and the various places, there would be hundreds or thousands of people out waiting to see that train when we came down. 
4501's move from the KNT down to TVRM opened up the eyes of the railroad to the fact that steam locomotives were far enough removed from daily life that they had become a novelty. When they ran the locomotive, uh, not only was the public surprised, but even the railroad officials were surprised. It was astounding how many people turned out to see this unusual occurrence. Upon arrival in Chattanooga, 4501 was taken to Tennessee Valley's small display yard at the old Western Union property. The locomotive arrived over there and Paul immediately wanted to run the locomotive because he wasn't allowed to run it uh, on the southern you know, right-of-way at all. But once it was off of their right-of-way and on Western Union's property, he could, he could put his hand on the throttle, which he was itching to do, and he did and he promptly ran the locomotive off the end of the track. That was just the, just the lead truck, but uh, he, he ran, <laughs> ran it off the end of the track. And uh, he and my father and a couple of other fellows, they, they actually fought it for a little while, but they managed to re-rail the thing, and uh, all was good by, by nightfall. After years of hard work at the K&T, and with her flu time ready to expire, Merriman, Sewell, and other TVRM members realized that a complete rebuild was in order. TVRM was, was really just getting started. There wasn't a whole lot to it. There had been a lot of meetings, plans for the future, things like that, but there wasn't much funding. And when Merriman bought the 4501 and brought it down to Chattanooga, that really put TVRM in the limelight. They were kind of like, okay, now what? Uh, they really didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, the locomotive was in need of a, a lot of repairs. Uh, it needed new flues. And they had no shop. They had no money. They had no facility. They didn't have any tools to mount anything. Not much of anything. It was really just a, a storage facility where there were some passenger cars, a few oddball pieces of uh, other equipment, the, the two uh, street cars from New Orleans just sitting out in the in the rain at Western Union. So they started taking the locomotive apart without any real understanding of how they were going to get it back together, uh, knowing it was going to cost a fair amount of money that they didn't have. We didn't have a permanent location at the time in, in 64. We had rented, rented space in downtown Chattanooga at the Western Union Pole Yard. Um, we did have a location, but it wasn't really open to the public. It was more of just a, an area to work on locomotives and cars, which they did. Enter Lucy Boiler Company, a local business with a railroad spur, willing owners, and space to restore a steam locomotive. Shortly after her triumphant arrival, 4501 was stripped down and moved to Lucy to begin her first major restoration as a museum piece. The people that owned uh, Lucy Boiler were, were very good to TVRM to let the locomotive be stored in their facility and have access to their tools and different things like that. Um, if it hadn't been for, for Lucy, I don't know where they would have restored the engine, to be honest. Uh, we worked uh, every Saturday that we could, and then we worked on Tuesday night. We had Tuesday night work sessions. Again, it was a situation where we didn't have money to pay Lucy to do a lot of work. You know, they could have retubed it or whatever but we couldn't afford it. Now to say it was restored might be a little bit of a stretch. It was, uh, it was returned to operating condition would probably be a much better way to put that. You're asking an organization of just a few people to really go out on a limb and make something happen. In some ways, very entrepreneurial. Today we would look at them, they, those same people, Paul Merriman and, and uh, Bob Sewell and others would probably be today's you know, uh, high tech, uh, internet uh, entrepreneurs uh, trying things and doing things different. They were just doing it with an old steam engine. 
the public was enthralled. And the railroad officials were equally enthralled when they saw how enthralled the public was. And uh, that really is what led to the STEAM program. Had that, that public excitement not taken place, I'm not sure it ever would have even considered a STEAM program. While 4501 was at Lucy Boiler Company, Southern's attitude toward STEAM was softening. At the urging of Graham Clater, Southern contributed a complete set of new flues to the museum, valued at $5,000. This donation, along with other monetary assistance from the Southern, made restoration possible. Meanwhile, another steam locomotive found itself on Southern rails, this time in Atlanta. SNA 750, a light Pacific from the Atlanta chapter of the National Railway Historical Society, or NRHS, ran a trip from Atlanta to Fort Valley and returned. It was on this trip that Graham Clater began to make important connections in the steam community, including a chance meeting with a Southern Railway employee by the name of Bill Purdy. This meeting would soon play a big role in 4501's future. Clater was secretly piecing together a bold new PR program for the Southern. With Brosnan's reluctant approval, he had the green light to expand the program further than anyone could have ever imagined. And with 4501's restoration nearing completion in Chattanooga, Clater was in a position to execute his plan. Finally, in early 1966, 4501's restoration was finished, and she was beautiful. Now adorned in the classic sylvan green and gold trim of the railroad's beloved PS4 Pacifics, she emerged from Lucy Boiler Company as a star, ready for her role as Southern's new ambassador. When the locomotive came here from the K&T, it was black. Uh, it, and of course, it had always been black up until uh, it went in, into the shop in uh, 1965 and 6 uh, for its restoration. Uh, it was black when it operated on the Southern all its life. Came out of the shop at Lucy Boiler Company green, principally because Graham Clater wanted it green. Paul was fine with that, and I, I don't think anybody objected to the locomotive being painted green. I think they were those that just kind of thought, ah, eh, well, whatever. Well, the locomotive received a pretty good cosmetic overhaul while it was in at Lucy Boiler Company. Uh, and my father made every effort to put the locomotive into its prototypical USRA appearance from the 1930s. That's when the handrails were corrected and the toolbox was removed from the pilot and they made changes to some other handrails. That's when the bell was taken off the shelf and, and mounted to the front of the boiler. In a nod to steam era tradition, the name of 4501's regular engineer was painted under the cab window, Walter C. Dove. He was down there looking at it one day and it just so happened that the angle he was at, the grab iron, the, the bar across the engine blocked out his name where you couldn't see it. And he was fussing about that, you know. Test runs were largely successful, much to the relief of TVRM's small band of volunteers. They thought it would be a good idea to take a steam engine around the country and let another generation see what a steam engine looked like. On August 18, 1966, she made her first public debut at Terminal Station in Chattanooga. The trip ahead of her was immense, but would become one of the most well-known and historically significant steam tours to grace the South. Well, it was obviously the first long journey that any locomotive had taken out on the main line of a railroad in, in the eastern you know, part of the U.S. in some time, especially the southeast. Uh, it was the beginning of the steam program. On day one, she journeyed from Chattanooga to Danville, Kentucky, as she retraced the CNO and TP through Stearns. Over the course of the next week, 4501 made impressions on young and old alike in Danville, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, and New Albany, Indiana, before making an about face and heading south for the annual National Railway Historical Society convention in Richmond, Virginia. It was amazing the response that it elicited from the public. Uh, everywhere it went, uh, the people turned out in droves. You know, I remember the early excursions uh, everywhere we would operate to, the high school band would show up and play and welcome the locomotive into town and all this stuff and the mayor would come out and sometimes they'd cut ribbons and all kinds of things. It was a really big deal and uh, boy everybody everybody really enjoyed it, which of course is, is, is why the Southern continued to do it 
all of that wonderful publicity they were receiving as a result of this. What amazed them was that there were more people coming out to the track site to certain towns than lived in the town. And that's, I think, when they realized the PR value of a steam locomotive. On August 23rd, 4501 departed Louisville heading east to Danville, then south on the CNO and TP toward Knoxville. Just north of Somerset, Kentucky that afternoon, the spring saddle over the third axle broke and spewed leaves out like a deck of cards between the rails. Somerset must have been bad luck for the 4501, as her frame still retained the bend from her unfortunate shop accident a few decades prior. The engine limped south into downtown Somerset, where she and her crew spent the night, and work began in the morning. Bob Sewell had shipped a spare spring from the K&T shops up to Somerset on train two early that morning, and crews went to work immediately the next day. Finally, she was ready, and she completed the remainder of a four-day journey to Richmond via Knoxville, Asheville, and Salisbury. With just a few hiccups, 4501 had kicked off Clater's new program in a big way, and Graham was pleased. In spite of Clater's love of steam, Brosnan liked him. So much so, in fact, that Clater was Brosnan's hand-picked successor as president of Southern Railway. And on November 28, 1967, D.W. Brosnan retired, and Clater took his rightful place as steam's champion. Mr. Brosnan later on told Dad that uh, once the steam program was up and going, uh, he actually rode a, rode a trip, and Mr. Brosnan rode a few trips with us. He actually told Dad, he says, you know, it might have been a little premature in cutting up some of those steam engines. So he, he, he realized that there was some good in it. Of course, Mr. Clater saw the good in it uh, day one. Clater immediately went to work expanding the steam program. One thing you have to remember in, in the 60s when these things started, passenger trains were still pretty common. So really the only difference was the motive power on the front end. You're able to say, I've got a steam engine on the front of this train instead of a couple old tired F7s or whatever they happen to be using. Uh, so in some ways the experience was no different from anybody who was still riding a passenger train. Uh, in many cases people were still coming out from the nostalgia of the steam engine. The passenger train didn't, didn't make any difference. On June 3rd, 1967, she departed Chattanooga for a 20-day long road trip to Cincinnati via Danville and Lexington. Atlanta was next in July, followed by Birmingham, Anniston, and Talladega before returning to spend the fall in Birmingham. The atmosphere, I would say, was, you know, um, enthusiastic. You know, I mean, people were excited to be going right behind a steam locomotive. Lots of smoke, lots of whistle blowing, you know, uh, photo run bys. Atmosphere was a lot different then. Unfortunately, litigation in this country has deemed that a lot of the things that they, would, they, they did at that time, they would never even consider doing today. The early days of the STEAM program, and really all of the days on the Southern that I recall, it was, uh, it was a pretty laid back uh, affair all around. They had uh, a recording car on the front of the train generally that had an open, it was a, uh, you know, combination baggage car and, and coach. And the front section, that was the baggage section, they had the, they had the baggage doors open and just some railing uh, to keep the passengers from falling out of the car. And uh, that was all open and the vestibules were all open and the commissary car, it was just a baggage car. We had those doors open as well. And uh, on the rear of the train was just an open air. It didn't even have any windows. The windows had all been removed observation car and that was a real treat to ride back there it was completely open and, and you could get a real good view of everything and hear everything and lots of cinders and soot and everything else it was a delight the southern railway particularly still had an infrastructure of people and uh, facilities that were there to handle the things that are required to run a passenger train whether it be how you water it how you maintain it uh, people who sell the tickets all those things were still in place and which made it pretty easy to do. With 4501 heading back to the K&T shops and Stearns to address several issues that had developed while on the road, Clater needed more power to keep things rolling. By the end of 1967, East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railways 207 and 208 were the first steam locomotives purchased by Southern Railway since 1928. But the sisters felt right at home as they were both former Southern steamers engine 630 and 722.
630-722-750-4501. With Southern's list of active steam locomotives growing, Graham Clater needed resources. You look at photos of the locomotive when it was going around and, you know, the back of the tender looked like a pickup truck going to the flea market. You know, they, they had stuff piled all over it, ladders and lubricants and, and, and larger tools and, and all sorts of stuff. You know, it was not an established program. Clater's first priority was keeping his expanding fleet of locomotives running. Many long trips with heavy trains at high rates of speed did no favors to the aging locomotives. But as it so happened, Clater already knew the man for the job, Bill Purdy, whom he'd met on the 1966 excursion to Fort Valley, Georgia. Dad was a very matter of fact, very kind, very gracious person. He was good with people. Uh, Daddy had a, a, a mechanical sense about him anyway. From what I understand from the time he was a little boy, he was down at the, wherever anything was being made, that's where he was, learning how it was made, what, what went into it. He started Southern Railway in 1936 on, in Pegram shop as a machinist helper. So, you know, he had 14 years of working literally from the ground up on steam locomotives, from the frame literally right on up. His father worked for Southern Railway as a machinist. So dad took a lot of pride in his work uh, back then, making sure that things were lined up the way they were supposed to be, uh, uh, aesthetically looked right, that sort of thing. He just took, if he was going to do it, his theory was let's do it right, do it right the first time, we won't have to come back. In January 1968, Clater summoned Purdy to Southern's headquarters in Washington, where Purdy was offered and graciously accepted the position of master mechanic, Steam. Clater now had a full-time mechanic to keep the program running, but he needed a place to perform the maintenance. It didn't take long to decide on the Irondale Diesel Shops, just outside of Birmingham. The shops had seen little use since being constructed shortly after dieselization, so it would be the perfect place to conduct repairs and overhauls without impeding the flow of the railroad. Purdy immediately began work on 630, and she was out on the road by February. While 630 was on the road for nearly the whole year of 1968, 4501 continued her repair work in Stearns, where they had the machinery to properly maintain her. Finally, on November 29, 1968, after performing test runs at her old K&T stomping grounds, 4501 made her way back south to Chattanooga for another round of fantastic shows. Next, Clater turned his attention to managing his emerging steam program. He approached Jim Beislein, one of Clater's former colleagues in Southern's law department during the presidency of D.W. Brosnan. Also sharing a love of steam, Beislein seemed the perfect person for the position. His duties included the planning, organization, and representation of the Southern steam program. He reported directly to Clater, and he helped expand the program by leaps and bounds. A lot of effort had to go into, uh, you know, maintaining the locomotives and keeping them out there on the line with a, a limited budget. And that's the thing Mr. Beisline and Mr. Purdy were able to do. They were able to keep the program going successfully, uh, you know, when the railroad wasn't giving them a tremendous budget to, to run this program. With a mounting team of qualified and willing employees and volunteers at hand, 4501's role in the STEAM program exploded. Knoxville, Crossville, Birmingham, Anniston, Louisville, Danville, Princeton, and St. Louis. 4501 played the part perfectly as Southern's living, breathing, attention-getting ambassador to the public. From the very beginning, the 4501 was basically leased to the uh, Southern Railway. That was a way to let the Southern spend money on it, which if it was privately owned, they would not be able to do. So Paul created the 4501 Corporation, and through that, parts and things were able to flow through a lease uh, from the Southern Railway to the efforts to restore the engine and then operate it in the future. That lease continued from uh, the Southern Railway days all the way into the Norfolk Southern. Well, the excursion program was so important for TVRM. That's where a majority of our funding came, and that, for the most part, was our funding for our annual budget. Once the STEAM program really got underway and the 4501 went into that service, uh, it rarely came back to the Railroad Museum. The only time the 4501 generally would come to Chattanooga was if it was part of that year's schedule, which typically was always in the fall. 
uh, where we run our autumn leaf special, and a lot of times there was a spring trip. Now that could be any steam engine, but when the 01 was the engine for the year, then we would see it come to Chattanooga. As the program expanded, a bond began to form between the employees, regular volunteers, and the public. As far as the number of volunteers, I don't know how I would be able to calculate the number of volunteers. Uh, every town had a group of volunteers. From that period forward, then it went to the railroad employees. I always had to call the engineer, maybe I called firemen who didn't know anything about firing a steam locomotive, division officers, road foreman, general road foreman. Mr. Purdy was always there, and sometimes one of his general foremen that, that he had at the time were there. And then they used volunteers as the firemen. Paul Brock, Carl Kruger, uh, Ronald Norman. Uh, uh, Paul was almost always there. Uh, there were other guys that came along, came and went during the years. Hal Edmonds was, a, was someone who volunteered. He lived in New Orleans. Uh, a lot of these people paid their own expenses and came out on their own and did this, you know. Uh, some were not employees of the railroad, but the railroad helped, you know, take care of their expenses while they were out there because they'd be gone for days and days and days at a time away from home. The way those trips worked, you had Southern was providing the line, of course, and there would be different historical associations around the the region that would sponsor the trips and they would be taxed with selling the tickets and having the onboard amenities available, that type of thing. The reward came for all the work during the week was of course being able to cut coal on the trip and get to ride and you know that sort of thing. I mean we still had some people that went along uh, all the time, myself included, but you still used volunteers uh, because they wanted to help. It was their opportunity to be a part of something like this. And why not share it? That's what we were there for. Uh, we were there to, to extol goodwill. And if, a, if somebody came up and wanted to help get dirty, get greasy, crawling around and, and uh, doing heavy labor work and enjoy it and, and feel good at the end of the day about it, why not? Now that's, that's the, that was one of the other factors that was good about the STEAM program. It, it garnered a tremendous amount of goodwill on a personal level, and as a result, Daddy wound up with, with friends literally all over the Southern Railway system. There were times when you would think that you didn't want the trip to end because everything was going just that well, and you hated for the trip to end because you were just having fun, quite frankly. The steam excursion season was primarily scheduled between April and November, at which time Southern would pack as many as 70 trips in each year. Naturally, such a hectic schedule resulted in some interesting problems. It was beyond chaotic for the people that were involved in the operation and the maintenance of the locomotive because while there were some facilities that were still conducive to steam locomotives, like I remember Purdy talking about, you know, they actually found ash pits that were still open. So they try to go over and dump ash in the ash pit so as to not make the, uh, the, the maintenance away people angry by dumping ash all over you know, their ballast in a yard or whatever. There were a lot of people that uh, in the early days threw up, you know, oh, where are you going to water it? How are you going to coal it? So that really was not an issue. Uh, uh, watering the locomotive was certainly no issue at all. Uh, as my father was very fond of saying, anywhere you have a fire plug, you can water a steam locomotive. So that, that just, that issue could be immediately done away with. Uh, coaling was a little more of an issue, but but not so much. They, you know, for most of the steam program, they, they hauled a gondola car full of coal around with it and coaled it that way. It was, it was, it was never a big problem. Especially small town fire departments love to get out with their fire truck. It was good publicity for them, for the people to see. And it was, it was, it was again, a, a meeting, if you will, of, of community coming together with railroad and, and a, a lot of good things, a lot of goodwill came of that. It was really the rare excursion that went off without any problems whatsoever. There were quite a few that the train limped back into town many, many hours behind schedule. They never had giant budgets, you know. I mean, they, they would do what was absolutely necessary to keep them safe and keep them out on the main line. The idea of missing a trip did not appeal to Dad whatsoever. People bought a ticket to ride behind a steam locomotive and he was determined that they were going to get to do that. That was typical. Even, even the first trip of 4501, when it came to Chattanooga, it had a hot box on the tender. So there was always something that would creep up. We were coming through, gee, it was either Rockwood or Harriman or, or 
somewhere up there on the CNO and TP, and somehow the, the water line from the tender to the locomotive got tangled up and ripped off of the, of the tender and, uh, and destroyed, essentially, and that, that, that side of the locomotive. And then everybody was just standing around kind of scratching their head because the water was exiting the tender at a rapid pace and there was nothing anybody could do about it. Uh, and then we had a number of occasions, hot journal issues, which that was always a problem over the years from time to time. Oh, uh, yeah, there were problems. From December to March, Purdy and his team would work at a frantic pace to perform any major maintenance or upgrades on the engines at Irondale. Steam hadn't been gone that long at that time. You know, 15, uh, 20 years, 25 years at the most. There were still a few parts tucked away in sheds and buildings and, and shop corners that he found. And those, those parts would make their way back to Birmingham to be used at a later time. One upgrade to 4501 took place in 1969, when her tender from K&T was swapped for an ex-Central of Georgia tender that came from a wreck train. The new tender held 18 tons of coal and 15,000 gallons of water, a major improvement on range and one that she still carries to this day. Clater was carrying out his dream, and in the process drawing a lot of positive attention from the public. Well, everywhere it went, we were on the front page of all the newspapers. That's free advertisement. And Mr. Clater knew that. So everywhere we went, you know, photographers are out, interviews are being made, we're on the evening news. Southern Railway was in everybody's living room. In one instance, uh, uh, he, he brought a, a shipper up, a potential shipper up to the cab and, and said, told dad, said, here, I would like for this gentleman to ride with you for the next, you know, whatever. And uh, he did, and the gentleman started shipping with Southern Railway right after that. Even Hollywood noticed the commotion that Clater's engines were causing. Throughout the years, Southern's fleet, and primarily 4501, strutted their stuff on the silver screen. In 1970, 4501 rolled into her first feature film on the set of Fool's Parade, starring Jimmy Stewart and Ann Baxter. Since the movie was being shot in Moundsville, West Virginia, on a Baltimore and Ohio line, 4501 shed her sylvan green for the plain, gritty black of a B&O steamer. 4501 went on to star in seven other feature films and television shows, including Johnny Cash's 1974 special, Riding the Rails. It was a plus because the engine was doing its job. It was garnering uh, attention, it was uh, goodwill, and not only that, but it was also bringing life, the, the, the previous life to those who were too young to remember it when it was, when it was going on. Throughout the 1970s, 4501 was a regular fixture on the excursion schedule. She even found her way off Southern property in 1973 for a series of trips on the Illinois Central, Chicago and Northwestern, Milwaukee Road, Rock Island, and of course, the Norfolk and Western. Some of the biggies I know uh, for it were probably Chicago. It went to Chicago and ran a trip in 73 out to uh, Bureau, Illinois on the Rock Island. That was a green and gold rocket. Um, the, uh, it, from there it went up to uh, Baraboo, I think it is, Wisconsin, you know, for the circus train, same, same time period. Came back on one of the, I think, Roanoke, Roanoke Chapter Independence Limited from Chicago across Indiana, Ohio. Uh, to uh, West Virginia, back eventually winding up in Roanoke on the NW. Made some trips over the, you know, at some point over the Western Maryland, maybe that same same trip. Um, made made a trip up Saluda, made a trip down Saluda. Went to Nashville on the LNN in 1980. Made a trip across the LNN from uh, in the seaboard from Jacksonville, Florida to New Orleans. Until then, the 4501 had been part of Paul Merriman's 4501 Corporation. But in 1975, Merriman deeded her to TVRM, where she's been ever since. In fact, it was during 4501's 1980 trip to Nashville that she was added to the National Register of Historic Places. Both Paul Merriman and Bob Sewell were present at the ceremony. On April 23, 1976, 4501 suffered the first of several significant mechanical failures that would take place over the next five years. They're out running it on one trip or another in 76, and Mr. Purdy wasn't running it, but he, uh, he was in the cab at the very least, and he said all of a sudden, 
the engine took off like a racehorse that had been whipped too hard. And the, the, whoever was running it tried shutting in on the throttle and, and nothing happened. The engine just kept going, 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 going. And, uh, you know, Purdy said he reached over and, and, and grabbed a hold of the quadrant and started bringing the quadrant up, which is an effective means to shut off steam to the cylinders. Well, they figured out that something had happened, whether the throttle had fallen off of the dry pipe or the dry pipe had, you know, collapsed or whatever, they no longer had control. So they got the train to whatever um, engine terminal it was and opened it up you know, probably two days later and found that the dry pipe had collapsed. Following the dry pipe failure, 4501 was repaired and continued to operate through five more seasons until 1981, when yet another failure occurred. On April 11th, her front flu sheet cracked in Dalton, Georgia, and she was unable to continue. Bill Purdy and his crew finished out the trip with diesel power, then towed 4501 back to Birmingham for a long-term rebuild. She would not operate again for three and a half years. By the time 4501's rebuild was completed in 1984, the clock was ticking on her excursion career. With the arrival of superpowers such as 611 and 1218, 4501's usefulness was waning. Obviously, the bigger power could haul more cars. And the Southern Steam Program was, at that time, uh, well, it continued to gain in popularity. And it was growing to the point where we couldn't literally haul enough cars. We couldn't, uh, we were turning away people constantly. They were running a lot of excursions. They were running long trains. And the 4501 simply wasn't up to it all the time. The next piece of, of, of that factor, that factors into this is the change from uh, Southern to Norfolk Southern. Uh, the, 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 the coming of the 611, Robert Clater in charge in NW, as opposed to a Southern man, you know, and he knew what the, he was raised up on the NW, he knew what the superpower could do. Slowly but surely, the 4501 got kind of pushed out of the picture. She ran until the end of the 1985 season before being retired from the program. For the next five years, 4501 was confined to TVRM property while 611 and 1218 stole the show on the main line. It's about 1990, Carl Jensen called again and said, you know, hey, we could use the 4501 some. Would you guys be interested in, you know, getting it out here and helping us, you know, with some of the excursions? So we did. We, uh, we put a set of flues in it and, uh, you know, it had, had a tremendous amount of work done in, in 85. And it really was, you know, the running gear was in decent shape and it had a lot of work done and really only had one season of operation on it. So. We went out at that point and ran in 90 to 94 uh, off and on, running some of the trips that they couldn't run with the big engines. And so that sort of brought its second life in the excursion program after, uh, you know, having sat out a few years. In 1991, 4501 joined the NNW Superpower for a grand spectacle presented by NS for the 25th anniversary of the STEAM program. 4501, 611, and 1218 would triple head from the former terminal station in Chattanooga, Tennessee to Ottawa, Tennessee. The show was amazing. Following the 25th anniversary triple header, 4501 continued to see limited use in the STEAM program. Then, in 1994, the unthinkable happened. Well, the first STEAM program was, was highly successful for many years. And, of course, being as young as I was, I just figured it would always be there. Uh, once Graham Clater was gone from the scene and the management changed, that was it. It was over. Maybe it didn't go out as graceful as it should have, uh, but you know, uh, I know I know they got a lot of bad press over it and whatnot. But you know, they they made a business decision. You can't fault them for the decision that they made to stop. Somehow or another, the focus of the program, which was a public relations tool, it became almost a slave 
to the National Railway Historical Society chapters. It became a money-making tool and the corporate purpose kind of got lost. The plug was pulled, it was shut down. In fact, it was shut down with a really firm fist uh, to the point that, to make the point that it was not coming back and that it was over. And we all thought it was. Uh, I think everybody thought it was. Well, when the first steam program ended in 1994, that brought 4501 back to Chattanooga, basically for storage. Um, but we did put it back into operation and we ran it some here in Chattanooga for uh, on the Missionary Ridge Local and that type of thing. Now, with a lack of funds and limited manpower, TVRM knew that once her flu time expired, 4501 would be silent indefinitely. In 1996, she was returned to her original coat of black paint for TVRM's 35th anniversary, which she wore right up until her final trips for the museum on September 20th, 1998. The mood, you know, it was, it was a little bit somber. It was, um, no, it, they, you had that sense of, of not knowing what would be next for the engine and um, a lot of people th thought at that point, including myself, that we'd never see it run again. You know, I guess it was really the feeling of the unknown that, that was the hardest thing because it's not like there was any type of a plan in place for it to be restored at a certain point. It was, it was looked upon as a retirement. Having grown up with 4501 and, and it being such a big part of my life, it, it, was, it was upsetting. Displaying a cold steam engine is like propping up a corpse. Paul Merriman. Sometimes things that happen in this business are a, are a series of, of events that happen sort of separately but have some relationship to each other. You know, we'd gone a number of years. This is, you know, probably in the late, early 2000s. And I was sitting down here and, you know, we always, you know, well, I wish we could, you know, do something with the railroad again. And so I'm sitting there with my notes and, and I just come up with 21st century steam. You know, I wrote that down as, you know, how would, how would we do a steam program in the 21st century? And I was just brainstorming. Wick Mormon is, is, a, is a great friend to so many of our organizations, the heritage, uh, railroad heritage industry, uh, because that's, a, that's an interest of his. Through a, a series of events, he became president in about 2004 and um, we arranged to have him come speak to the uh, NRHS convention that we were uh, hosting in 2007. And he came and gave his, his talk and I think somebody asked him about steam and he was kind of, you know, although I think a rail fan, he was a little noncommittal about what might or might not happen. 2010 would mark 16 years since the death of the original steam program and 12 years since 4501 was last under steam. The return of mainline steam to the South had never seemed so unlikely. The first indications that we witnessed of something taking place as far as the return of limited passenger operation on NS uh, were diesel excursions. Uh, they ran some limited diesel excursions and they ran them mostly for uh, NS employees. They were doing things with historic railroad equipment that they had not done for quite a number of years. One of the things that might have opened our eyes a little bit that there might be something coming along in the future was when there was a group of individuals who privately funded a boiler assessment of the locomotive. I was actually pulling into a Hardee's one Saturday morning and my phone rang and it was Wick, he was in the office and he said, can we go ahead and, and do that ultrasonic test you were talking about on the 4501? I said, why? And he said, well, we just, you know, let's find out whether or not it really can be restored. Because we had some concerns when it had been put up the last time that there were some pretty major repairs that would have to be done before it could operate. So I said, well, yeah, but it's going to cost about ten or $12,000. And he said, well, let's make some calls to some people and see if we can raise that. It was not an offer from the Norfolk Southern, it was, it was a personal offer to see if we couldn't put together a group of people who, who could help us out. And we did. I don't think at that time, I don't know if Wick had the idea that this might be where he was headed. Um, he certainly didn't tell us that it was. 
but later in 2009, he started asking some questions about how we might go about a program. In June 2010, Norfolk Southern made an unprecedented announcement. Steam would return to the main line by spring 2011. In a partnership with TVRN, Norfolk Southern would operate newly restored 280 number 630 over their main lines on both public and private employee excursions. The CEO of Norfolk Southern, Wick Mormon, is, is obviously uh, a, a very intelligent guy who understands the value of good marketing. And uh, I, I think he saw what Graham Clater saw, and that was an opportunity to get a, a good positive spin on uh, for Norfolk Southern uh, with the resumption of the Sting program. Up until that point, there was no reason for the museum to restore the 4501, uh, really because it was just too big for what we uh, were doing in our daily operations. Um, but once they had announced the, the start of the 21st Century STEAM, well, that gave new possibility and new hope for the 4501. TVRM's new partnership with Norfolk Southern was a big step towards getting 4501 back in STEAM and out on the main line again. So with their help and, you know, the, the Railroad Museum, of course, uh, we got the thing in the shop, started to evaluate it. And at the time, we were still finishing up the 630. So after our initial evaluations on the 4501 were complete, we focused our efforts on 630, got it out of the shop, and then went right to work on the 4501. One of the things that when we were talking about doing this with the railroad was, you know, how do you want to approach this? Do you want to go minimalistic or you want to go you know, big scale, and uh, they, they basically came back and said, hey, we want to go, go big time. Normally when you engage in a restoration, you have to come up with the money, and first, before you can get the money, you have to know how much you need. So that's why it's approachable way it is. This locomotive, it was, all right, it's been sitting for the last, you know, decade plus, however long it had been, let's start working on it and do whatever we have to to get out the door. So there wasn't really a whole lot of planning that actually occurred with it. It was a case by case basis. It was used a lot when new, uh, as some of the guys around here says. The 4501 was in uh, not the best of shape. Uh, it, had, it had severe wear on a lot of the, a lot of the uh, wearing surfaces journals, pens, bearings. And a lot of that had to be either renewed, replaced, or repaired. Nowadays, restoring a steam locomotive, you don't have a plethora of parts um, like they had back in the day. Or suppliers that call up and send you a, a lubricator or an air compressor or whatever it may be. So you, you're kind of left with what you have as far as what was left over from the steam days, repairing that, restoring that, whatever you need to do. And in worst cases, actually replacing it, and that means a lot of additional cost in, in casting uh, uh, new parts, uh, the patterns for the castings, the machining of the parts, and so on and so forth. So it is a little bit more of a challenge today, um, especially on some of those really hard to find items. Um, but it can be done. There was um, a few unexpected problems uh, that arose during the restoration, uh, one of which was uh, we had NDT'd uh, the axles and to make sure there was no cracks. And well, we, we didn't think we would have a crack to deal with. Unfortunately, we did. So we had a, a main axle uh, that we actually replaced. Um, the firebox, uh, that was a big issue with the, the locomotive in this rebuild. Had a lot of, you know, a lot of areas that we needed to, to address attention to. We didn't know exactly the, how in depth we would get in the firebox repair until we actually got into it and started uh, realizing that we, we needed to go more. And eventually we ended up putting a whole firebox in it. So it was time after time after time where we confronted something where it wasn't just a matter of replacing the consumable part, but we had to repair the substrate that the part went into. You know, it had pretty significant boiler work done, uh, as well as running gear work. Uh, just because, uh, like I say, the, the condition, it was, it had been ran for who knows how many miles since of a repair of, of this magnitude has taken place. I was there for two and a half years and wound up 
doing an incredible amount of welding on the boiler. I went through five 50 pound tins of welding rod, <laughs> which probably about half of that actually was deposited onto the boiler. Another big milestone, or actually a few big milestones, were the addition of a few appliances that the engine did not have in its regular service, uh, nor an excursion service, but some of its sister locomotives did receive. Uh, and that was the addition of a feed water heater. Granted, it's a Chinese feed water heater. However, it's the, the, the concept, the principle, the functionality uh, is, is identical to, to what the Worthington uh, SA system was because basically the Chinese just copied a Worthington SA system, and, uh, a three and a half SA system, and, and used it. And that's what we put on the locomotive. Uh, another addition that we put on the locomotive was a stoker. Uh, a lot of its sisters also had a stoker, uh, and this one did not, it was hand fired. So with the addition of a stoker and the feed water heater, I think we've greatly increased the efficiency of the locomotive, um, and also um, helped the, the fireman's back as well. Uh, not having to shovel so much coal on the main line. Um, some other improvements that we made uh, were roller bearing lead truck and roller bearing trailing truck, uh, as well as some other uh, spring and frame modifications on the trailing truck to, uh, to make it correctly function. From what we were able to tell in going through uh, maintenance records and blueprints and, 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 and just everything we had access to uh, throughout the restoration, we found that the 4501 is likely the only one that did not receive improvements like a stoker and or a feed water system because not all the MS class got both. It was a wise curatorial decision to take steps to preserve the artifact. Every single modification that is cosmetically changed the locomotive was done in keeping with what the Southern Railway actually did to the other MS class engines that saw the same improvements. You know, railroads kept steam locomotives operating mechanically in a range where you only had to replace consumable parts. Whereas in today's world, because of some of the mythology associated with steam operation that came from the end of steam, people run locomotives until the parts are basically not serviceable. And not everybody does, but a lot of people do. So it's given steam kind of an unfair um, perception. If you treat a locomotive so as to prolong the life of all the components, you know, act in due diligence, check your tram, the, 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 the spacing between the axles on a yearly basis, make sure everything is kept tight, they're really not that maintenance intensive. If you have everything that is in tram or correctly positioned, uh, and well lubricated, uh, a steam locomotive will, will last for, for quite a while. Uh, I'm not going to say indefinite because that's not true. Everything mechanical will eventually wear out, but you will definitely get longer life out of it. I think the 4501 is in the best shape that it's been in a very long time. You name it, we went through it uh, on this locomotive, and if it needed replacing or repaired, we repaired or replaced it. Uh, that's really the first time in its history that it received a full stem to stern restoration. Uh, we went into it pretty deep. You know, we, it took us longer to get it done uh, and cost us more. But you know, we have two magnificent locomotives as a result on you know the efforts that were put into both of them. Well, the restoration was made up of a number of people, both TVRM employees and volunteers and contractors um, from all over the country, really. Um, that came in and, and helped us with this. The people, um, you know, here uh, are, are really a great bunch of guys. Uh, very smart, intelligent people and hardworking. And um, there's, there's not much that, that can't be done, uh, I do believe, here. Wednesday, September 3rd, 2014, the culmination of thousands of hours of manpower and 103 years of history had come to a head. After 16 long years of silence and a painstaking multi-year restoration process, 4501 is almost ready to make her comeback. Well, as the restoration of 4501 was nearing completion, that was right about the time for Railfest, and it was decided that we would do our best to have the engine ready for Railfest. We were 
nonstop almost. We had seen the engine in the shop for so long, little things happening to it that took a lot of work, but it wasn't until those last final things happen when you really, it's, it kind of sets in that yes, it's gonna run, we're gonna see it, it's gonna be soon. And a lot of times that's the paint. When the paint goes on, that's almost the last step to the, before the fire up and the final tweaking almost. And, and that's where it really sets in that, uh, you know, the excitement kind of builds up to that point and almost bubbles over. With her grand debut scheduled at TVRM's annual Railfest event in just three days, the restoration team is rushing to put the final touches on their star. In fact, at this point, 4501 hasn't even turned a wheel under her own power since her retirement in 1998. But with a boiler full of water and a brand new authentic black paint job, she's primed for action. Her fire was lit the next morning. Thursday was spent testing the numerous appliances on the engine, including dynamo, stoker, and air compressor. After a full day of working out the kinks, the crew set up for a milestone event, 4501's first move under her own power in 16 years. Well, seeing 4501 back under steam was pretty emotional, uh, to be honest. Um, again, I, I never thought we'd see it. Um, I have a 10-year-old son. I never thought he'd get to experience seeing and riding behind the 4501 like I did. And, and that personally was, was part of it for me, too. Not just being able to see it, but knowing that my son would get to see it, too. So it, it was emotional, very exciting, and, uh, and, and just a thrill. To see the 4501 run again was, was it was very rewarding, uh, you know, and not just for myself, but everybody involved uh, with the project, uh, because you know there's a lot of people that put a lot of time, you know, a lot of sweat and tears into that project uh, to see it run, uh, not just myself, but uh, you know, I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank the Tennessee Valley Road Museum, Norfolk Southern, and, and all the all the help that we had uh, here in the restoration, and uh, you guys know who you are. My father was absolutely convinced at the time that he, he passed away that uh, 4501 would, would likely never run again. To see it move that first time under its own steam was uh, truly a, a moving experience. Uh, really, it moved me to tears. It was, it was uh, a dream come true. The only emotion that I felt was anxiety. <laughs> because if there was a problem with any of that stuff, whose fault was it gonna be? With another long day under their belts, the crew got some rest in preparation for more strenuous test runs on Friday. The next morning finds 4501 slumbering under steam at East Chattanooga with Sister 630. This is the first time that TVRM has had two operating steam locomotives since 1998. Having woken from her lengthy sleep, it's time to put 4501 through her paces. After more tests are run on appliances and adjustments are made, the crew cautiously and patiently eases 4501 out onto the main line. The first order of business is to turn her so she can run east to Grand Junction. When you get a steam locomotive uh, through such an overhaul and repair uh, with all new parts, um, all new tolerances, you really don't want to come out of the shop and run it wide open, run it really hard, really fast. What we like to do is, is kind of break everything in slowly um, and, and make sure we don't have any issues at, you know, five or ten miles an hour as opposed to you know, 40 miles an hour, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier to deal with uh, any issues and also kind of help breaking the bearings in. Uh, you don't want to buy a new car, similar, you don't want to buy a new car, uh, you know, brand new off the lot and then go redline it the, the, the first, you know, the first test run you do with it and, and possibly blow something up. 
Uh, not saying you couldn't, but it's not a good idea. The test runs are almost perfect. By day's end, the crew feels prepared to debut 4501 to the world tomorrow. When 4501 appeared at Railfest, it was a little bit like a circus. A lot of people hadn't ever seen the engine run, some of the younger people. So that, you know, that was exciting for me to see because 4501 introduced so many people over the years to steam and here's that special engine coming back online and kind of having that same effect on, on another generation. So that was neat to see. I'd like to welcome you all to Railfest 2014. And of course today is a very significant day for us here at TVRM because it is uh, the first operation of the 4501 in 5,730 days, not that we've been keeping count. Anyway, Shane, uh, if you would like to do the honor, do we have an extra bottle in case the first one doesn't work? You know, that goes sometimes. So uh, if you want to break it over the coupler here, uh, we'll, we'll get going. Here we go. Now that 4501 has made her grand entrance, the TVRM crew will spend the remainder of the year breaking her in with events such as the Somerville Steam Specials, featuring a double header with 630. Tens of thousands of people admire her, but everyone is eagerly awaiting the main event, 4501's return to the main line. The morning of May 1st, 2015, finds 4501 quietly simmering at Grand Junction in Chattanooga, Tennessee. With the announcement of her inclusion in Norfolk Southern's 2015 season of 21st century steam excursions, the time has finally come to return her to the main line. Anticipation fills the air as her crew prepares for a quick break-in run to Cleveland, Tennessee in return. Anytime you have a major overhaul of locomotive, you have to take it out. and break it in slowly and we've been doing that here at the museum for some time. We've been running 10, 15 miles an hour on a lot of uh, territory and getting the bearings broken in. Uh, now we're ready to move up to some higher speeds and test the locomotive and see that it's, uh, you know, it's going to perform the way it's supposed to. At 10.45 a.m., the conductor of NS Train 957, the symbol under which 4501 and her crew are running, receives permission to open the switch on the main line. And at 1049, 4501's wheels touch the main line for the first time since 1998.
4501 made the 44-mile round trip in good time and without incident. Upon arrival back at the museum, the crew feels ready to take her out on the road for the coming series of public trips that summer. Throughout the 2015 season, 4501 operated a total of 10 public trips for Norfolk Southern out of Bristol, Virginia, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Macon, Georgia. For fans, crew members, and the public alike, the experience is just as thrilling as it was on June 6, 1964, when 4501 ran from Stearns to Chattanooga. Um, just seeing the scenery and uh, I guess just the rocky motion of the train, it's very relaxing. I'm uh, from Columbus, Ohio. Drove about five and a half hours to see it today. Uh, I've just been a rail fan all my life. I love steam engines and wanted to shoot this line. Well, I think it's great that steam's back on the main line and has a place to run and making a lot of people happy. Southern Railway MS Class 282 number 4501, the queen of steam, the 37,085th product of Baldwin Locomotive Works, the pride and joy of countless men and women. In 2015, she's back where she belongs, stretching her legs and strutting her stuff for thousands of admirers. There's nothing like a steam locomotive. Uh, there's just so much involved with it. I, I, I think people, you've got the history, you've got that connection to history, how steam locomotives helped to build the country. It has a lot of importance to a lot of people, uh, not just in the southeast, but really nationwide. It's a delight to me to see this locomotive finally restored and operating again, something that we never thought would happen. Uh, as a child, I was certainly elated every time I was around it and got to see it operate and, and ride behind it. And now, another generation will get to do that and experience those same things that I experienced. And it'll be as delightful to them, maybe even more so, than it was to me. To preserve history is, is, is vital. You've got to see where you've been in order to know where you're going to go and for people to understand how to move forward and to have an appreciation for what was, uh, having 4501 operating is crucial. I think so much of it is just tied to the history that it has, and it will always have that history. That's not going to go away, so it's always a history that will be told and retold, and stories will be handed down from generation to generation. 4501 is a survivor. Look at all the times it survived the main line and went into you know short line service and then it survived short line service and went into excursion service and you know, it's been, not every year but it's been running for how many years you know uh, well over 100 years now it won't be long until it's it actually operated in excursion service longer than it has operated in actual revenue freight service 1964 1966 until now you know 
So, you know, that's 50 years. <laughs> that's a long time. You know, it is a survivor. I mean, you know, it's, it's just, we, we keep finding new reasons to, you know, to, to bring it out again and let people see what's going on. The 4501 is a good ambassador, a good representation of all of its uh, 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 sisters of its class. One, it's, it's, well, it, it is the one. It is the only one left. So it, it's got to be, of course, the best ambassador. It is a good thing to let another generation know what a steam locomotive is. W. Graham Clater, Jr. This one is very controversial. What made the museum choose black paint? <laughs> Here's another one to tread carefully with. How was the decision made to paint the engine black? <laughs> That's my answer. You know, the joke there for a while was, you know, we ought to uh, paint it down the middle, one side black and one side green. So depending on who who wants to take their pictures from a, you know whatever side you, uh, you know get get whatever color scheme that they wanted so <laughs> the color paint is obviously an emotional thing with a lot of people it was green it was black you know southern passenger trains were green uh, freight engines were painted green I mean there's a right answer for everything uh, but uh, at the end of the day uh, I think that uh, you know, some, you know, a lot of people talked about it, and at the end of the day, uh, somebody has to kind of finally make a decision, and that's exactly what we did, and so it's black. Some people liked that, some people didn't, but as always, no matter what color it is, when it's running, that's what makes it so special.